Okay, guys, this is the only video you're going to get from me for this unit, so you better enjoy it. Hopefully you found the Scratch presentations about supply and demand and the changes in supply and demand and how prices are formed um, to be enlightening, but in this video I want to take those, uh, those presentations, that information, and connect it a little bit more into your life experience, especially those of you who have ever gone to the store and taken a look at some price and thought, that is completely outrageous. Who would ever charge it that much for that product? In this video, first I'm going to talk about some different theories about where value, where prices come from, and then maybe you guys will find something in there that you like. Um, and then after that I'm going to talk about some of the implications of the price system as I've explained it in the various Scratch presentations that I've made. Really the oldest theory of value is called the just price theory. That's the idea that for every good there's one morally correct price and anybody who charges more than that is, uh, well, not a very good person. Some of you guys think of, uh, that think that way when you guys go to the store. Eventually people sort of moved on from this to uh, what was known as the labor theory of value. Um, and this was convincing enough that both Adam Smith and Karl Marx agreed with this. Um, but this was the idea that uh, an item's price or an item's value uh, came from how much labor it required to produce it. Of course, as we've already discovered in our class discussions, you guys don't usually value the same thing the same way in every different circumstance or situation. So that kind of rules out just price theory. And you really don't care how much time it took someone to produce something. Um, really, you're more concerned about how useful it is to you. So that sort of rules out the labor theory. And both of these are what are called intrinsic value theories. In other words, the value of the good is intrinsic to the good. It doesn't matter on the person who is considering whether to buy the good. It is always valuable in the same degree no matter what. So thinking in this way, economists moved on from those theories of value. Um, to something called the utility theory, which is that things are valuable insofar as they are useful to someone. So that so the same thing could have a different value to one person um, and a different value to another person. This may have been an improvement on previous theories, but there were still some really important questions that this theory sort of failed to address. For example, water is much more important to human survival than diamonds are. But for some reason, humans value diamonds much more highly than they value water. At least they'll be, able, they'll be willing to pay more for that. So the utility value can't really explain that, so we had to come up with something else. That something else was called marginalism. So marginalism, or the marginal theory of value, um, is the idea that value is derived from how much somebody would be willing to trade for one more of a good or service. So because diamonds are relatively rare compared to water, people are willing to trade more for it. Hopefully you guys remember the idea of thinking on the margins from the last unit, um, which is thinking at that last or the very next unit of production or the next unit of purchase or something like that. As you guys have seen from the Scratch presentation, the marginal theory probably comes closest of the theories that we've talked about to uh, explaining exactly why prices in the marketplace are the way they are. And they are the way they are because of the interchange of demand and supply. For reasons that I've talked about in other places, the market price always tends to move toward the equilibrium or market clearing price. Now it never actually reaches any such price because uh, conditions on the market are always changing too quickly. Supply and demand change too quickly for that ever to actually happen. Um, but that leads to a very interesting phenomenon, which is that the price automatically takes into account changes in demand and supply. That means that price changes signal changes in everything that cause changes in demand and supply. For example, um, changes in population, consumer taste, consumer expectations, income, related goods, cost of production, technology, all of those changes are integrated into the price without you even knowing about it. If you woke up this morning and saw that there was a lot of rioting going on in Egypt, you might think to yourself, well, I better economize on gas because uh, I don't know what gas imports to the United States are going to be like now. Of course, if you wanted to live your whole life that way, you'd have to read a ton of news. You'd have to take in a lot of data. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that because even if you didn't read the news this morning, 
you'll still see that information reflected in the price of, ga of gas at the pump, um, and you'll still act according to that because prices might rise because people expect that there's going to be less of it around in the future. Now, all of this has other important implications. If we tried to make a government bureau of economic planning who would be in charge of organizing the entire economy so that it would run better than it's run so far, um, even if we hired a million people to collect data from everywhere around the world, they still wouldn't be able to do as good a job at transmitting that information or incorporating it into the economy as spontaneous free market prices can. And we don't have to pay the price system like we would have to pay government bureaucrats. So the next time you go to the store and complain that they're selling something for much more than it costs them to make it, just remember that prices don't just come from cost of production, they also come from how much consumers value it and are willing to pay. And the next time you complain that a price is unreasonable and you still go ahead and pay it anyway, ask yourself, am I an unreasonable person? And I guess it's possible that you are, but that's really none of my business. Anyway, that's all I've got for you, so uh, free and out.